Well, good evening, beloved, and happy Wednesday, happy Wednesday evening, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're in the book of Hebrews, and uh, we don't know the author. He's not named. It's just a quick review, but uh, very educated in the Greek language, probably Alexandrian, writing to Hebrew believers that because of persecution, we're starting to drift back and some willfully going back into Judaism. Maybe pressure from family, certainly pressure from, from uh, persecution. And so this pastor, he's a pastor, he, he's, uh, but he's writing, he's writing to them, and it's a sermon. It's, it's, it's sermonic. Uh, it's different than the letters of Paul in that regard that were so instructional. Uh, this is a strong encouragement. He even calls himself an encourager at the end. But strong encouragement, some <laughs> forms of that is the admonition, warning about uh, the danger of going backwards rather than forward with Christ. Well, let's pray as we uh, begin uh, this evening. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we are grateful to study your word because you, Holy Spirit, are our teacher. And so teach us spiritual truth this evening. As we read your word, may we hear the eternal ring to it and the invitation to it to press on and to move upward and onward with Christ to spiritual maturity. And that's what we desire, to love you more and more and one another with your love more and more. And only you can make that happen, God. And so make it happen by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray, the name which is above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen and hallelujah. Well, we left off last week in uh, chapter 5, uh, let's back up to verse 5 because uh, he's talking about the two qualifications for uh, the high priest. And one was uh, a full identity with the people. And the second one, he had to be appointed by God. And so how Christ is our high priest. He says, so also Christ did not exalt. This is verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that's where we left off last week. Now, two things very important. Uh, the, the quote from Psalm 2, uh, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and Psalm 110, the great psalm that Jesus uh, referred to when he was asking the religious leaders how David, who David was talking about when he said, the Lord, Yahweh said to my Lord, the, the messianic, uh, uh, the coming uh, Messiah, you are a priest. Uh, forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so we have two things that are happening here. Psalm 2 talking about the, uh, the great king that God has uh, chosen to be his king and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is what is placing Jesus in a much greater high priest role than Aaron ever was, and, and that David, the king, ever was. David was not a priest. He wanted to be one, but he was not one. He was the political leader, and the high priest was the spiritual leader. And here in Jesus Christ, we see them both combined. Now, he's going to talk some more about uh, Melchizedek, but uh, there's going to be another one of these parentheses in here as we'll see right now. Verse 7 is where we pick up tonight. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, 
and he was heard because of his reverence. Okay, let's just take that one verse right there. What is this in reference? This is in reference to the Garden of Gethsemane and the, the intense stress and suffering that Jesus began to experience in the garden on the night he was betrayed, so much so that he sweat his sweat became like great drops of blood. He began bleeding uh, just from the pressure. And, of course, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane was an uh, olive press that, uh, uh, where Jesus prayed. And it was so intense. Uh, Jesus uh, prayed, let this cup pass. Uh, nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. And, of course, he's making reference here to the identity of Jesus with us in our suffering. And remember, writing to Hebrew believers coming out of Judaism, but because of persecution, because of suffering, they were uh, being tempted to go back into Judaism and renounce their confession, to uh, deny their faith in Christ and just hold fast to their... their uh, he their Judy, uh, Judy, uh, Jewish roots. Well, he says, He offered up prayers and supplication, loud cries, to him who was able to save him from death. Now, of course, that's a phrase that we have to ask ourselves. What, uh, he went on the next day on Friday and died. And so what was Jesus, what was the author saying that he was... Uh, to, crying out to him who was able to save him from death. Now, one, one interpretation of that was that Jesus felt like he was dying right there. That the suffering was so intense, the pressure was so intense of the coming uh, of the full separation from the Father because of sin, he would bear the sin of of the whole world and the wages of sin is death and death separated from God and uh, the, the son eternal son of God had never experienced that and the very thought of it was some interpreters say was killing him and so what his prayer was in the garden of Gethsemane was strength to make it to the cross the next day that he would be delivered from death at that moment because it was bearing down on him so hard. Now, beloved, we don't even have a clue as to the intensity of the suffering that Jesus experienced beginning in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, his whole, min his whole life was a humiliation and suffering, the absence of what he had experienced in, in the glory of heaven, uh, the glory with the Father that he prayed that that might be restored in John 17. But, but listen, y'all, the, 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 as much as we could say about it, we still don't even come close to it. We could talk about how intense it is, and we don't even, we're not even near the intensity of it. And so it could be that, or there's other uh, interpreters that say that this phrase in Greek, uh, to save from death, can also... Uh, very easily and legitimately be translated uh, out of death that uh, that God would and he was speaking of the of his resurrection but either way Jesus was heard because of his purity because of his his uh, 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 complete, a purity and fellowship with the Father. And this is also important because remember who he's writing to and we can identify it sometime or another in our lives going through suffering that we also cry out with intense uh, agony. Deliver me, Lord. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so he's, he's encouraging them not to fall away from the, uh, the, uh, what could happen in suffering. Look at how the next verse begins. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. 
and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He picks that back up. And, uh, but boy, we've got, a, we've got a, a lot to unpack here in this beginning in verse 8, 8, 9, and 10. He was a son. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Again, a very clear word of instruction for them and for us in periods of suffering. This is opportunity. This is opportunity for learning. And sometimes we'll talk about that when we're entering into a time of trial and suffering. We say, Lord, I know you're trying to teach me something here. Just help me to learn it. In fact, I've even prayed, Lord, I know you're trying to teach me something. I don't care if I fail or not. I just want the test to be over. And No, but here's the opportunity to uh, grow. And uh, you say, well, I, Jesus was perfect. What would he learn? He learned obedience uh, through what he suffered and made perfect. I thought he was perfect. Now, the, the, uh, uh, the Greek word translated perfect is the uh, word uh, telestai, which means accomplished or complete or matured. And, uh, and this, the writer of Hebrews likes this phrase, being made perfect. Uh, he became the source of eternity, he, that, that he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect. Jesus had to suffer to fulfill righteousness. You remember that's the word, exactly what he said when he went for baptism to John. And John said, I, I need to be baptized by you. And remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 3. He said, uh, suffer it to be so, let it be so, for it will fulfill uh, all righteousness. It will complete what God has given to both of us to do. John's ministry was incomplete until he baptized Jesus. And Jesus' ministry of identifying with sinners, I was humiliating in itself, because people who were going to be baptized were confessing their sins. And he had no sin to confess. But he identified with sinners and in baptism showed how he would save us from our sins by his death, his burial, and resurrection, which, as we know, is pictured in believers' baptism. And so, uh, but here's the, the point. Jesus had never experienced what he was beginning to experience with this suffering, separation from God. And so in his incarnation, it was essential that he experience this suffering and learn the full depth of obedience, perfect obedience through it to fulfill, to, com to, to complete uh, uh, his humanity. Amen. Don't ask me to say it again. I'm not sure that I could. <laughs> but again, writing to those who were caving to uh, and being disobedient to encourage them through suffering that they would learn obedience and be made complete, be made perfect. Now, now he's, this is not the first time he's used that phrase uh, to be made perfect. Look back at chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10, For it was fitting that he, talking about uh, God, the Father, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, that is, that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Jesus, referring to his identity with us, referring to us as brothers, it says, was made perfect. The founder of their salvation, Jesus, was made perfect through suffering, was made complete. And then uh, look at the chapter 7, verse uh, 28. 
Chapter 7, verse 28. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of, uh, but the word of the oath which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever, made complete. Look at uh, chapter 7, uh, uh, I'm sorry, look at chapter 10, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of the realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would have ceased to have been offered by the worship. Okay, again, referring to how the Old Testament law could not make a person complete, perfect. Why would you go back to that? And then look at chapter 10, uh, verse 14. Chapter 10, verse 14. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus has made us complete. Because of what he accomplished, he offers that to us that we might be made complete. And then, of course, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, the last verse, the great chapter on faith, the Old Testament uh, uh, saints, uh, verse 39 and all these, though commended, that means they were a, a, a awarded righteousness, they, were, they, they had the testimony of God that they were righteous, although these, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made complete, perfect. In other words, they had to wait for the coming of Christ for their perfection. They were awarded righteousness by faith, but still looked forward to the one who would accomplish the full uh, perfection, the full salvation, and offer it to them. They waited for it. And uh, he's telling us, to also wait for it. Don't go back. Let's look forward to the return of Jesus. And then uh, one more for us. Look at chapter 12, uh, verse 23. Talking about well, verse 22. But you, who have, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Okay, so... Uh, he, he uses this phrase uh, again and again to talk about uh, being made perfect, being made complete, to encourage, to go on, to go on to that, to move forward and not to move back. Okay, verse 8, back to chapter 5, verse 8. We're still unpacking these three huge verses of 5, 6, of, I mean of, of 8, 9, and 10. Uh, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, obey him. There's, there's that uh, encouragement since Jesus obeyed the Father and was made perfect, that we too should follow his example, that we too should be obedient to him, to Christ, so that we too may be made perfect and be made complete. Now I want to talk just a minute about this uh, phrase eternal salvation because uh, the writer of Hebrews, he likes uh, to turn this phrase in uh, different ways. Uh, the eternal salvation. Look at chapter 9, verse 12. Uh, we'll run, on, run into it again. Chapter 9, verse 12. 
He says, uh, he entered once, talking about Christ, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Uh, That's pretty much the same as eternal salvation, but we're talking about salvation like deliverance from and redemption being purchased back being uh, accepted uh, back and given a second chance. And then take, take a look at uh, ch- in verse 15, chapter 9, verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And then in chapter 13, verse 20, he talks about the eternal covenant. Uh, that's then that, that great blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete. <laughs> and we'll pick that up whenever we reach chapter 13, verse 20. Okay, so back to... Uh, these three great themes that uh, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered, and so will we if we obey him, and uh, who was made perfect, who was made complete in his suffering. And, uh, uh, and he is, there again, our high priest with the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is the second time that he has mentioned the name Melchizedek, and we've already said, who is this strange figure in the Old Testament? It means much more to believers, Christians, than it did to, Jude- uh, to the Jews. In fact, in Judaism, he was kind of uh, pushed aside, only mentioned twice, and, and, uh, and not, uh, not in a very good light, actually, because for the Jews, because... Uh, in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 14, first place he's mentioned, he first blesses Abraham and then God. And the Jews said that's backwards. And uh, some of the Jews uh, even uh, recognized uh, this figure, Melchizedek, as Shem, the uh, son of Noah, who overlapped Abraham by a hundred years, according to the the uh, age given to the uh, patriarchs in Genesis, and uh, uh, well, we'll we'll pick up more on that later. Because verse eleven, he even says this. He says about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. That's one of my favorite verses. Chapter 5, verse 14, talking about the spiritual discipline, uh, the disciplines that we constantly engage in in order to to, uh, develop our spiritual senses to discern, to distinguish good from evil. That's wisdom, the fear of the Lord. And uh, But let's back up a minute because here he's getting ready to do the same thing he did, the writer of Hebrews, in chapter 214, when he starts talking about this high priest that, that identified himself with us, and, uh, and then suddenly takes a, an excursion, he's definitely a preacher, he's not chasing a rabbit here, he's, t- he's taking off and he's introducing something else that he'll develop later. But in chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 14, uh, 13, remember he, he, he stopped talking about Jesus as a high priest 
and started warning about not entering that rest. Remember when we talked about that? And uh, strong warning that those uh, not drifting, like you said in the first part of chapter 2, but willfully rebelled, that male population that came out of Egypt, willful re willfully rebelled and refused to enter that rest. And he says, strive to enter that rest that that God has placed before us. Don't go back like they wanted to because all they did was die in the wilderness. And so again, he's doing the same, he's using the same tactic. He introduces the uh, Jesus as the priest ordained by God, appointed after the order of Melchizedek that he'll fully develop in chapter 7, but before he does, he goes into another one of these strong warnings of chapter 6. He says, uh, he, and before we go there, he says, we, gotta, we want to talk about this some more, but, but it's kind of hard to explain, especially to people who have become dull of hearing. Now that phrase, dull of hearing, is used in, in the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint and Proverbs, to talk about the lazy man the slothful man, dull of hearing, hard of hearing, refusing to hear. And the reason is because, well, this is hard. Give me a headache crying out loud. I don't want to understand this. Go slower. Don't preach so long or whatever. I've got, my attention span is too short. That's, that's, that's a, a sign of immaturity. And, and we've got to develop our attention span to the spiritual things. Amen. And to go on to uh, uh, the deeper things. But he says, you ought to already be there. He says, you ought to be teaching uh, these things. And yet, you're still stuck on the basic principles, the very foundation things of the oracles of God. In other words, the Jews had already been given the foundation of Judaism, the Old Testament law. And so these Hebrew believers... Uh, should be the teacher since they had already been schooled in the, the, the fullness of what was incomplete in the law. They had the foundation. And so they should be teachers, but he says, but you're still choking on milk. And uh, how, can you, how are you going to manage uh, the solid food that uh, is for uh, the mature? Now, of course, this phrase... Uh, Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 3, talking about the Corinthians being carnal and having only been able to handle milk because they were still carnal. They were still flesh of the flesh. They had not grown spiritually. Simon Peter uses this in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, to new believers, uh, in a, and not comparing it to solid food, but to say, oh, you... you desire that spirit that pure spiritual milk of the word whereby you grow but again peter is talking in his letter to new believers to babies and uh, of course the letter of first peter is uh, many scholars uh, commentators talk about uh, being a a uh, a teaching uh, uh, before baptism uh, as he will talk about in that letter. And so it was to new, new believers hadn't even been baptized yet, but uh, beginning to be taught from 1 Peter. Well, we're not studying 1 Peter. We're studying Hebrews. And he says that comparing it to solid food, he says you should already be chewing the solid meat of the Word, but you're choking on milk. And uh, he says there's something better for you. Therefore, he says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and uh, go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Oh, what's just got to stop right there. I don't know if we can even finish it with a, a few minutes that we have left. Maybe we should wait till next week. No, I'll try to, I'll, I'll review some next week. Let's go ahead and touch on it now.
So instead of saying to them, all right, we can't go to solid food. Uh, we're going to have to stay with milk for a while since you can't ha handle solid food. Instead, he says, no, let us go on to maturity. He won't let them go back, beloved. He won't let them go back. He says, I'm taking a chance here. I'm going to lose some of you along the way because you're dull of hearing and you may choke. If you're choking on milk, you're going to really choke on solid food, but we're going to take that chance. We're not going back. Let's, lead, let's go on. Let's be, in fact, the phrase is we're going to be carried on. The Holy Spirit wants us to go on. And so he's going to carry us on. We've got to leave the foundational elementary doctrines of Christ. Now, he named six things, three pairs. If I were to ask you, what are the elementary doctrines of Christ? I'm not sure you would name these six. Probably not. Uh, we may talk about repentance and faith as an elementary doctrine, or we may talk about the full humanity and the full deity of Jesus Christ as an elementary doctrine. Salvation by faith is an elementary doctrine. But he names three pairs, obvious pairs, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, uh, instructions about washings, and that word is the word baptismo, that we get our word baptism. It's plural uh, of, of immersions, of baptisms, and laying on of hands, and resurrection of the dead and, et and eternal judgment. These were, uh, these were Jewish uh, th these, th these six things, these three pairs, were like the high watermark of Judaism, which is the elementary doctrine of Christianity. The highest ethical teaching of the Old Testament law, as he summarizes with these three pairs, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, that's Old Testament. That's, that's Abraham get, uh, obtaining righteousness by believing in God, in Phineas, the, uh, uh, the, the son of Eliezer, grandson of Aaron, who was, was given righteousness because of his zeal in uh, executing that Jewish man and Moabite uh, uh, adulteress uh, there in Numbers. Well, so, but he says, but that, that's in the Old Testament. And of, of washings and laying on of hands, that had to do with the sacrifices. The priests went through ritual baths several before they could enter in to help the people with their sacrifices. And when they did their sacrifices, they laid their hands on the sacrifice to impart sin. And the, and the washings and laying on of hands was also done with the commissioning of priests, imparting to them a ministry, a work to do. And so this was, this was elementary in Christianity. It was full maturity understanding in Judaism. It was the high water mark. But the, high, the point is, he's making, the highest that you could get in Judaism is the very foundation, the lowest level of Christianity. And he said, we can talk about those elementary things again of repentance toward debt from dead works and Faith toward God, obviously, with Christianity and seen in Jesus Christ. Repenting from uh, a righteousness by works, that's dead works, but faith toward God. Of washings, maybe the baptism of repentance and the baptism of fire by the Holy Spirit. Uh, those early disciples were baptized that way. Uh, in fact, in the early church, there were some, uh, there was practice of a baptism twice, baptism of repentance, baptism of, of uh, uh, death, burial, and resurrection identity with Christ to symbolize turning from uh, repentance. Some even bapt went down three times. I've been asked that many times. Are you going to, I'm going to take you under the water and bring you up? And I've been asked, are you going to do that three times? I said, no, I'm going to pronounce uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Maybe you've seen people baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, and then the uh, resurrection from the dead, that was the Pharisees. They promoted, and there was a big disagreement, but the Pharisees were the most righteous ones of Judaism, and they believed in the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment that God would then at the end of time judge. This is Daniel 7, and he would do that through his son. The writer of Hebrews calls those the elementary doctrines. He would refer them to milk, and uh, we don't want to go back to that. We want to go on. He says, let us go on to maturity, not laying again the elementary doctrines, uh, but uh, he even says in verse 3, but if we need to, we will, if God permits it, if we have to. All right, beloved, I'm out of time, but we've got to apply this to ourselves. We've got to encourage one another, and especially with this verse. I just skipped, just touched the, the hem of it there, the very, just knocked at the door of it. Hebrews 5, 14, uh, let us uh, go on to maturity. Let us, uh, a solid food is for the mature, for those that have their spiritual senses trained by constant use to discern good from evil. That's wisdom. And we want to go on to maturity. That means exercising our spiritual senses and not going not just going back over the elementary things. Sometimes we're guilty of that because it's hard to go on to maturity. It's hard to look at Scripture, and, and especially the book of Hebrews. Not an easy book. And we read that and we say, I don't get that. And our temptation is, well, we'll just come back to it later. Excuse me, some other time. No, we cannot. We've got to dig and question and pray and memorize and meditate those verses that we don't understand uh, so that we can uh, ask God to reveal the eternal truth and to grow in spiritual maturity. You know, these last eight months have been a trial, have been difficult, and it's really challenged us because we, we have not been able to enjoy the routine of our fellowship with one another, and we have missed one another. There's no question of that. Just like when someone moves away and we're not able to see them, and maybe they come back for some special occasion, we're so happy to see, oh, I've missed you, I've missed you. We say that over and over. And uh, But one thing it has helped us with, to go back to our personal relationship with God and to recognize that this is the foundation and that this is more important than anything else. There is no substitute for our personal relationship with God, our personal quiet time, our personal worship. And we've been reminded of, of the importance of that when we've had only that to have during this time of sheltering in place and quarantine. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing to be uh, reminded of the strength of foundation and the strength of our personal relationship with God and to go on to maturity with the discipline of spiritual challenge and, uh, and hardship and suffering. We don't ask for it, but when it comes, we know the purpose of it. It is that we may learn obedience through what we suffer. All right, and I'm really out of time. And uh, we sure don't want to begin verse 4 until next time, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened. Okay, we'll just save that for uh, next week. And may God bless you. May God keep you. May God cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you.
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May God keep you safe and healthy and give you a growing and fruitful faith in hope with love in the name which is above every name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and hallelujah.